All right, this morning we are looking at Joseph. Last week we looked at Mary. Now we're going to look at Joseph in this continuation of the saga of life wars. The Force Awakens. Now, with, with Mary, we saw that despite the circumstances that surrounded Mary's immaculate conception, she was favored. God favored her, and she was favored in his sight. That's huge. That's a big deal. Now, with Joseph, we're going to take a look at him and what this situation might have looked like for him, bearing the reproach of grace. That's why I called it the reproach of grace. Think about what this must have been like. Reflected in Joseph, we see the scandalous mercy of God toward us. And we're going to look into that a little bit. But I want to let you know, since we're in the book of Matthew this week, we're taking a little deviation. We've been in Luke every week. And next week, we're going back. Well, not next week, Christmas Eve. We're going back into Luke. But now we're moving over to Joseph, because we want to see a little bit of the Jewish context that they would have grown up in. They would have been living in this culture. Well, Matthew gives us a picture, if we dig, for what the reproach of God's grace toward us would look like. Luke was a Gentile, writing predominantly to Gentile followers of Jesus. Matthew, on the other hand, he was a Jew, and he was writing to Jews who would have known Jewish things. So we're going to have to get that explained a little bit so we can see the full weight of what's going on in Joseph's taking of Mary. So let's take a moment to pray and ask the Spirit to lead us, shall we? Father God, we beg your mercy. We beg your grace that you would give us your spirit so that by him we would come to understand your word, not just in the surface level, but that it would sink deep into the very marrow of who we are and inform us as a follower of Jesus. For it's in his name we pray, amen. So we're going to be in Matthew 1. Verses 18 through 25. The passages will be on the screen behind me, but I definitely encourage you to flip there in your own Bibles if you have them. So 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, (laughs) there are several things to look at here. First, Who do we see Joseph as being in this passage? If we go through, we see in verse 18 that Mary was betrothed to Joseph. So it's like an engagement type thing, betrothal. It's it's an older English word. You don't hear that one thrown around all that much, but it's, it's an engagement. They were engaged. And then in verse 19, it says, and Joseph, her husband. So we see there, just like I mentioned last week, that being engaged And being married was pretty much the same thing in the Jewish mindset. So we see that. Then we see in verse 19 again, 
that Joseph was a righteous man. He was a righteous man, and he didn't want to disgrace her, wanted to send her away silently, secretly. Well, this is important because if you know the Jewish law, if you're a Jew, you're like, whoa, she's found to be with child, but not by her husband. That was grounds for a stoning, according to Deuteronomy 22. So it was a big deal. He didn't want her to be disgraced. So he was a righteous man. <clears throat> and next, what did he do? He obeyed. He obeyed. He was visited by an angel and was told, don't fear. Take Mary as your wife. And so he obeyed that. And she stayed a virgin until giving birth to Jesus. And then lastly, he called him Jesus which means the Lord is salvation. Even in Jesus' name, we're seeing the Lord is salvation. The Lord is what the Jewish people would have known. Wow, this is, this is how I refer to God. I say the Lord because I don't want to say the holy name, the holy name of God, Yahweh. It's too, it's too holy. We don't want to say that. So we would say Lord so it was huge. His name is Jesus. The Lord is salvation. Salvation is coming through this child. So we're seeing these things. We're seeing obedience in Joseph. We're seeing righteousness in Joseph. So last week, last week we saw how Mary was slighted, obviously. She must have been slighted when she was found to be with child. Can you imagine the looks that she would have received? Well, what about Joseph? Can you imagine what he would have received? Mary was impure, the people thought, right? So what about Joseph? Joseph taking a woman who was considered impure. How could he do such a thing? Can you imagine the looks around town that they would have received? What must they have said about Joseph? What must they have said about Mary or about Jesus even before he was born? Can you imagine, guys, if you were hanging out with people and someone said cross or derogatory words about your wife, how would you feel toward that individual? Probably wouldn't want to hang around them for a while, huh? Maybe in your weaker moment, you might pull back and deck a fool, you know? Defend your bride. Your bride is worthy of defense. Nobody better talk down my bride, right? This is what Christ does for his bride, who is the church. One day he's going to come again, and nobody is going to step up to Christ's bride. There is no battle. Anyway, beautiful picture of Revelation. Side story. We can't get into that right now. But it's this beautiful picture. Joseph was a righteous man. He would have protected his bride. You know, the fact of life is that people are going to say horrible, horrible things about you at some point in time. Unfortunately, we learn this all too soon as we go through school. And when we're so young that we don't really have the background, the many years of life behind us to help us see that, you know, even though people are saying horrible things about me, that doesn't make it true. But we do, don't we? We see. Can I jack this up for a relatively tall person? Oh, there we go. All right. Or I'll just carry it. This might be kind of weird. I've never I've never done this before. How do I how do I handle the word and okay. <laughs> so, we've got we've got this picture of Joseph being thrust into this situation that just like we talked about last week, Mary wasn't looking forward to this. God kind of upset the apple cart because God had a plan. 
And it's the same way with Joseph. This isn't what I wrote down, you know, in my journal. This is not what I saw coming in my life. And so this starts happening, and you can imagine the reproach because we know intuitively that people will say horrible things, and they don't have to be true for people to say them. And it doesn't have to be true for it to hurt, right? Youth, amen, amen. It doesn't have to hurt. And youth, I got to tell you, a little confession, us adults, we're just you grown up. We still struggle. People say, say mean things to us, and we're like, oh. And we have this moment where we're like, oh, it must be true. It hurts, right? People say horrible things, and it doesn't have to be true. Well, Joseph, he was asked to bear the reproach of grace for Mary's sake, for Jesus' sake. Ultimately, for the sake of the whole world, he was called to bear the reproach of grace. He was also called to bear that reproach for the force of God's plan, of his purposes, his love for all of creation, and specifically for human beings. He was called to bear this. Why? For the birth of God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. Why? He will save the people from their sins. When we think of our own weaknesses, when we think of the weaknesses of those that we interact with on a daily basis, we know that we all need to be forgiven. We all need grace. The reproach of grace is being given something that we don't deserve. That's huge. Grace is basically a reproach to people who consider themselves to be on their own. You know, I I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps, but the reproach of grace says you're not on your own. You're not. God is with you always. But the reproach of grace, that's kind of all we know. If we're honest with ourselves, if we take that moment to still our minds, when we stop, right? Even if it's just in that moment between lying down and falling asleep, we notice in ourselves that we need grace. You know, sometimes you hear people say, what did did God see in me that he would die on the cross? Well, the beauty of Scripture and the reproach of grace is he didn't see anything in you. (laughs) That's the fact. It doesn't matter who you are, how good you consider yourself to have been. God didn't see anything in you. He did not die for you because you were worth it. Do you understand what I'm saying? This isn't for me to beat you down or beat myself down. This is to level the playing field. That is what Scripture does for us. That is what the Word of God, living and written, does for us. It levels the playing field. We are all slugs, slime. We are not worthy of the grace that God has given us. And so we bear that. That leads us to the second thing that the reproach of grace does. The reproach of grace puts us in our place. It puts us where we need to be, on our knees. When we're in a place of humility before God, before others, it's hard to be arrogant. It's hard to go to someone that we think, oh, man, this kind of sin, I haven't even touched sin like this. It keeps us from doing things like that and going to people in grace and mercy and saying, you know what? 
we're the same. We are in need of grace. If we're still standing before God, then we don't get it. I mean, think about the parable that Jesus tells in Matthew 20. I put it up there, Matthew 20, 1 through 16. It's one of those, the kingdom of heaven is like this. And so Jesus starts telling this story of a landowner that goes out and he calls on people to work his field. And there are some people that come. And then he goes out again later and he asks other people, hey, what are you doing standing around? Let's go work, work my field. And so they come. And he does that four times, this landowner does. And then at the end of the day, when night has fallen, he calls his foreman, his people in charge, and he says, bring everybody forward. And I want you to pay the ones who came last first. And so on, down to the end of the line. Now, what's interesting about this story is each time this wealthy landowner went out, he called the people to work and he said, hey, I'm going to give you a denarius, which is a day's wage for the people. I'm going to give you this. And the workers said, wow, that's great. So then when pay time comes at night, those who came last and only had an hour or two to work before the end of the day, they come to the line and they step up to the table and they're given a denarius. And they're like, wow, a full day's wage for just two hours. And can you imagine the excitement of the people in the back of the line who've been there working through the heat of the day? They're thinking, man, what am I going to get? Well, I mean, I know he said a denarius, but if those guys are getting a denarius, then what must I be getting? Oh, this is great. We're going to be able to splurge. We're going to go eat out tonight, I think. They're thinking, this is great. And then the line keeps coming, and all of a sudden, people start rumbling. Because, well, the person that worked for four hours... They get a denarius. And, and then the people that work for six hours, wait, they only get a denarius too. And then the people that were working for eight hours, they got a denarius. And the people that were working for ten hours, they only got a denarius. And can you see the upset? Why is the kingdom of heaven like this? Think about how long you have been following Christ. You've been following him your whole life, maybe. For you, maybe that's your 14. <laughs> maybe you're uh, 40. Maybe you're 80. Maybe you're just like, Jesus, come soon or take me home. <laughs> you know, you're right there. You want to go home. You've been following Christ this whole time. Maybe there's someone in your life that you've been praying for. And man, they've been the scuzz of the earth. You know what I'm talking about? They're the people you like to look down on, right? And they just have not been following Christ at all. They're, picture them, they're in the hospital. They're on their deathbed. They have moments left. Someone comes in, <laughs> some uppity pastor comes in and shares the gospel of Jesus with them, that they can be saved if all they do is turn from their sins and trust in Christ. And lo and behold, this person you've been praying for and talking with forever, it seems, sheds a tear of repentance. And they're like, I don't deserve this. And the pastor says, that's the point. And they give their life to Christ shortly before they die. And you just throw your hands up. Are you kidding me? I've been following Christ for 60 years. And that knucklehead sneaks in right under the cutoff date. Really? The kingdom of God 
the reproach of grace puts us all on equal footing before Christ. The reproach of grace that we are called to removes those feelings of justice. See, we disapprove of grace when we're too focused on justice. Justice reminds people of the debt that they owe. But when you think about that, if you're, if you're treating your life with Christ like a debt that you owe Christ, oh man, Christ died for me. Well, the least I can do is this. Don't think like that. You can't pay God back for his gift of mercy. That's grace. That's the reproach of grace. Grace wipes the debt away. There's nothing more to pay or repay or repay or dang, I messed up. Better get rebaptized. Better rededicate. No, you better come to a knowledge of who you are in Christ and live it out. Be there in the midst of it. That's what it means to be saved. Not to try to earn that grace, but to rest in the grace and allow Christ to change you. Now, we have a clip, as always, in this series from Star Wars, where we're going to see the reproach of grace. We're going to see what happens when grace hits people front and center. Oh, God. your aggressive feelings, boy. Let the hate flow through you. <laughs> Obi-Wan has taught you well. I will not fight you, father. Wise to lower your defenses. Your thoughts betray you, Father. I feel the good in you, the conflict. There is no conflict. You couldn't bring yourself to kill me before, and I don't believe you'll destroy me now. You underestimate the power of the dark side. If you will not fight, then you will meet your destiny. <laughs> Save your friends. Yes. Your thoughts betray you. Your feelings for them are strong. Especially for... Sister. So, you have a twin sister. Your feelings have now betrayed her too. Obi-Wan was wise to hide her from me. Now his failure is complete. If you will not turn to the dark side, then perhaps she will. Come on! <laughs> 
Never turn to the dark side. You failed, Your Highness. I am a Jedi, like my father before me. So, what happens if you're familiar with the movie? Luke stops. He will not take. Vader's life. And so the Emperor starts shocking Luke to take his life. As Luke is getting shocked, getting killed by the Emperor, you see Vader, he's struggling. What what do I do? And he finally takes the Emperor, throws him over the railing to his death, and Luke takes his father, tries to get him off the Death Star to save him. Father, I've got to save you, he says. His father, who had then taken off the mask, says, you already have. And at the end, we see when the force crew of uh, dead Jedis show up, you see Yoda, you see Obi-Wan Kenobi, and you see not Darth Vader, but Anakin Skywalker. You see the reproach of grace, and it took something for Luke to have that grace. When we give grace, this is the tie-in. Okay, this is the tie-in. What does Luke, Darth Vader, and the reproach of grace have to do with me? This is the tie-in. When you practice grace with people, at least initially, it's going to be a major shock to your system. (laughs) It can take it out of you. It can even wind up hurting. Being gracious is going to cost you. Like with Joseph, many won't get it. They won't get the grace. And in much the same way, we see in Luke chapter 4, verse 22, many people didn't get Jesus. They didn't get that grace. But see, the reproach of grace calls us to acknowledge the reality of what Christ has done in us. And it has us speaking not personal truth or opinion, but biblical truth. Jesus saves, not us. The Spirit transforms, not us. And the Word of God rebukes and challenges, not us. So when we talk to people, we talk with the word from a position on our knees. That's what we do. What do we expect of others? Live under the reproach of grace. And what we expect of others, wear it like a badge of honor that we are in need of grace ourselves. And we convey to others that they are in need of grace. What are we expecting of ourselves? You know, sometimes uh, we, we might think, oh, I just, I just want to get out of this life alive. Well, that's not going to happen. 
with us. We are to share Christ with boldness, to live confidently in the power of the Spirit. And those things can only happen by submitting ourselves to the Word daily. Suit up for your own life wars. I continue to challenge all of you to read Scripture daily. You know, you can do it in the evening. You can do it in the morning. You know, whatever you read in the evening will be with you when you wake up in the morning. Personally, I like to do it in the morning because I can screw up a lot. And so I need to suit up for the battle and get my head on straight first thing in the morning. We encourage you to do that here in this church. And uh, as Al said this morning, we have a devotional that we're going to encourage everybody to take that will help you. That will, it will give you something to read every day, but it will also push you to read more scripture. It's experiencing God. This is uh, the study that more than anything else, I think started me on the path to a faith that was not just something that my parents passed down to me, but it was something that was unique for myself. It was something that I had to own. It's when I started spiritually journaling uh, my prayers and uh, my anger, uh, my frustration toward God, my joys, recording those times when God has answered prayer, largely because of the study that these devotionals are based on. I encourage you to get one, to check it out. And so I challenge you, I challenge you this week, to welcome the reproach of grace in your own life and what that may look like. First, give what others don't deserve. That's the reproach of grace. It's not that you're waiting for them to reach a level that makes you feel comfortable around them. Give them the grace that they don't deserve. And when you find that you can't do that, maybe this next challenge is more difficult for you. Hit your knees. Fall on your knees and ask God for the grace to be gracious where you can't. God will give it to you. He will bless you with what you don't deserve so that you can bless others with what they don't deserve. It's a beautiful picture of this grace that God gives to all of us. And lastly, turn your devotional life into something that is natural as brushing your teeth. I don't say as natural as breathing because we get up and oftentimes we don't think in, out, in, out. But we have to think about brushing our teeth, don't we? And if we don't brush our teeth one day, you start to notice it a couple hours later, don't you? Maybe it's like when you're talking with someone and they're a close talker, you know, like in Seinfeld. Someone that gets up really close and then you're like, oh no, I smell me. That's I, I got I to gotta get that taken care of. I can't forget that next time. Develop a devotional life to where your need for God, your need for his word, your need to submit yourself and surrender your day to him in prayer from the start comes as natural to you as brushing your teeth. And that it's uncomfortable when you miss that. It's a beautiful place to be. As we come uh, forward, as the worship team comes forward to close us in a song of invitation, I encourage you to do your heart work with God in this place. And if you need prayer, if you need uh, to, to turn your life over to Christ, finally surrender to him, I encourage you to do that. If maybe what you need is to join a body of believers, because right now you're doing it on your own. 
I encourage you to come forward and let's talk about that. Would you stand with us as we sing?